particularly uh, the uh, uh, Science and Technology Institution in Agriculture led by Farah uh, with our friend, uh, um, Akim, um, um, of a friend, uh, Yemi Akim Bamajo here with us, but also with Korav, uh, Dr. Tenkwano, uh, with Asareka, with uh, uh, Cardesa, uh, and all those leading organizations to work together with them in agreement. We have our friend Redarago here. We'll work with them to take this to the next level. This is just a starting. And finally, uh, as we are rolling out Agua today, we got a couple more platforms coming uh, in the future, uh, next year, God willing. One that uh, focuses on trade, you know, the African agriculture trade, uh, pre-continental trade area is up and running. Uh, having tools to provide forecast and outlook and foresight in the areas of trade, to get trade data uh, on a digital platform is a, a work we've already started. We finished the analytics for Eastern, and Eastern Africa. We're moving to Western and Southern Africa. And once we're done with that, we'll have the, um, the platform up uh, sometime next year. Uh, the uh, second that we hope to launch next year is an offshoot of work on COVID. Uh, it's just a mapping of vulnerability across the continent to know how and where and what we need to do in case of the next shocks. COVID has woken up all of us, but the next drought, the next flood, social strife and other things are around the corner. It would be good for us to be prepared to know where the vulnerabilities lie at the community level and where the indicators and drivers of vulnerabilities are so we can focus on them when, uh, um, when disaster strikes again. So I'll stop here and thank you all for joining us. Thank you again, our moderator, Dr. Jemaya Manjuki. And it's now my pleasure and honor to invite Dr. Godfrey Bahigwa, Director of the African Union Department of Agriculture, Rural Development, the Bleak Academy and Sustainable Dev Environment, uh, to uh, um, give us uh, the keynote for this session today. Thank you, Dr. Bahigwa Karim. Asante sana. Um, our moderator, Dr. Jemai Manjuki, <coughs> and um, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to, uh, to give this uh, uh, short keynote address on this important topic today. Um, let, me, let me start by thanking Academia 2063 for inviting me to give a keynote address on this topic on harnessing artificial intelligence, technology, and big data for improved decision-making in Africa's agricultural production systems. Let me at the outset uh, say that I'm not an artificial intelligence, technology, or big data expert. Uh, in fact, I don't know why uh, Usman thought it was a good <laughs> idea for me to, to give this uh, keynote address. Uh, because this topic uh, can actually be quite intimidating uh, to an average person. But I guess um, they, they probably thought that I know something about the importance of data, especially good data to guide planning and decision making in any field, let alone the field we are passionate about, which is agriculture. One key aspiration for Africa is to become self-sufficient, uh, to feed its people. At the moment, Africa is a net food importer. Africa imports about $45 billion worth of food every year. And this is projected to increase to about 90 billion by 2030 if we, don't, if we do business as usual. For the rest of the world, this presents an opportunity to boost trade with Africa. It is a market for, uh, for the rest of the world to supply food to Africa. And yet for Africa with 60% of the world's arable land, mm. trade deficits mean foregone incomes for farmers. It means foregone jobs for our youth. I hope I do not offend uh, free trade enthusiasts with my remarks, but being self-sufficient does not exclude trade with others. But let me not divert our attention to trade from the subject 
of today. One way for Africa to address its food sufficiency question is to boost production and productivity. This has been the aspiration since African leaders adopted the comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program CADAP in Maputo, Mozambique in 2003. And this declaration was reaffirmed in 2014 in the Malabar Declaration that broadened uh, that declaration with more ambitious goals and targets to be achieved by 2025. The Malabar Declaration has a commitment to accelerate agricultural growth by at least doubling the 2014 agricultural productivity levels by 2025. The second Kadab annual review report that was adopted by the AU Assembly in February 2020 revealed that the continent was not on track towards doubling agricultural productivity by 2025. This means more effort is required to boost agricultural productivity. Boosting agricultural productivity and production requires that we address the factors that limit low, that lead to low crop yields at the farm level. These being pests and diseases, weeds, droughts, degraded, degraded soils, among others. Now, this leads me to the core subject of using artificial intelligence and big data to try and address these constraints. We all know that there is an investment in data collection systems in our countries. Despite the recommendations in numerous reports, including the Kada Banyo Review Report, to invest in improving agricultural data systems, we see little appetite by African governments to invest in this area. Yet, I want to believe that these same governments want or need credible data to help them make informed decisions. One reason could be that traditional data collection systems are very expensive. Therefore, it seems to me that we need to find alternative means of collecting and analyzing data that is hopefully cheaper and more accurate than the traditional methods. I hope that artificial intelligence, technology and big data offer this opportunity for African governments, policymakers and practitioners, especially farmers. Back to my disclaimer of not being a specialist in AI or uh, big data, uh, let me wrap up my address with expressing my hopes about what I would expect artificial, artificial intelligence and big data can do for Africa's agricultural production systems. One, in reference to the challenges that I, I mentioned earlier leading to low crop yields, I hope that they can help a farmer to identify crop pests and diseases and recommend appropriate pesticide use with recommended application rates. Two, I hope that they can help farmers identify common weeds and recommend herbicides to use and the application rates, hopefully linking to national data verification systems to avoid buying fake chemicals. Three, I hope that they can help governments and farmers to predict droughts or floods so as to plan emergency responses. And where irrigation is possible, I hope the tools can help the farmers to release water to crops when they need it. And four, I hope that these tools can help assess quality of soils and recommend types of fertilizer fertilizers that can be applied and the application rates. Finally, in today's discussion, I hope that we can talk about the preparedness and the capacity of governments, other users and farmers, and the role of regional and national academic and research institutions to popularize these tools. I expect regional and national research institutions 
to work with governments to support further development and popularization of proven tools for adoption by policymakers and practitioners, especially farmers. As you know, there are many decision support tools out there, but how far they go depends on their utility and how much people know about them. I hope that through regional and national partnerships, this tool can be improved and popularized. With this, I look forward to learning um, what the scientists at Academia 2063 have developed for the, in the, agriculture, in the Ag Africa Agriculture Watch. I hope that the web tool will help address some of my hopes that I expressed earlier about the application of artificial intelligence, technology, and big data for transforming Africa's food production systems. Perhaps this can be one of the game changers that Africa could consider for its common position to the UN Food Systems Summit later this year. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bahigwa. Um, we heard uh, the expectations. Uh, my team and myself have heard you. Uh, we also heard your call for partnership and collaboration and those two hang together. Some of the questions you raised, what you expect us to address, we can't do unless we work with our sister organizations, uh, with um, um, Dr. Dlaminis uh, Cardesa, uh, with uh, Dr. Warindas uh, Asareka, Dr. Vedragos, Grimet and Dr. Tenkwano Skoraf. Uh, we will be engaging extensively after the launch to see how we can get to the issues relating to cropping and cropping practices and how we can inform a government and the private sector alike uh, uh, on this road. Uh, allow me now to um, get our lead scientist, uh, Dr. Rassin Lee, behind this tool. He's a director of data management, digital products and technology at Academia 2063. He will present uh, the tools and the backgrounds uh, and the methodology behind it uh, before we then uh, move to the panel discussion, at which time I will hand over to Dr. Jemai Manjoki uh, for her moderation of the panel. So uh, the floor is yours, um, Rasim. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Osman. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us for this event of launching the Africa Agriculture Watch platform. So my name is Ras Hindi and um, I lead the Department of Data Management, uh, Digital Products and Technology at Academia 2063. Um, so today's presentation is about the contribution of AI and remote sensing to solving data issues in the Africa agricultural sector. So here the keywords are uh, two emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence and more uh, specifically machine learning and remote sensing data through satellite images. Um, but allow me first to start my presentation with a few uh, key messages. The first one is that we all know by now that African agricultural sector is facing several threats. Um, for example, we have the climate change um, with the erratic rainfall regimes and also um, um, spikes in the temperature. Um, and also pests and disease are just what Dr. Bahegua has said. Um, but the latest one that we witnessed is the COVID-19 pandemic. What those all threats have uh, in common is the need to have good planning uh, to reduce uncertainties across the sector, but also to reduce risks in taking decisions. Um, for that, uh, the conventional data gathering that um, we have and analytics in the African continent might not be adequate to reach that goal and the level of preparedness that is required to have the quality, the size and the frequency of the data um, to build the, the most likely scenarios in the near future uh, needs uh, that level of data. Um, what we believe is that remote sensing can help to reduce that data gap and machine learning can help to uh, us uh, to disentangle the hidden patterns within the data set and also make predictions to make the invisible visible or at least to, to be blurry. That's what the Africa Agricultural Watch is made for, uh, is to, by combining remote sensing and machine learning to disseminate knowledge for decision making. So we don't not only uh, try to help in solving the data gap using remote sensing, 
testing or to make predictions with machine learning to have the scenarios, but we go all the way to the dissemination part that can allow decision makers, uh, farmers, deciders, and planners to have access to those outputs for their decisions. Uh, my presentation today is a five-fold presentation. I will start with an anatomy of decision-making, and from there we will have two stops. The first one is a data issue, have a quick overview, and then what we mean by using remote sensing for that, uh, machine learning through predictions, and um, I will end up with the Agua conceptual framework, which is the bone, uh, the pillars uh, that uh, Agua has been uh, uh, built upon. And then we finish with the, what we can expect in terms of key products for the Agua platform. Um, let's get started with the anatomy of the decision making. So here's a graph that can uh, show you all the aspects that can intervene in decision making. Um, among judgment, you also have training, predictions, input data, and action and outcomes. So judgment, prediction, and training combined with input data can lead to an action and then an outcome. The feedback loop can help you to improve the training part. Uh, taking decisions sometimes um, uh, means relying on judgment and training. Those two can be enough based on experience and also background to make decisions. But um, now decision makers uh, do not um, uh, need to rely only on judgment or training, uh, or they can use judgment and training to add value to the input data and the prediction that we are providing. So as you can see, input data, inadequate input data can lead to actions that provide undesired outcome. The same trend also applies to predictions. So Agua focus on improving the input data and the predictions in the decision-making processes. Um, now let's talk a little bit about the data issue. If you look at the figure number two, um, you, you, see, you, you can see that we have a serious problem of data availability, uh, availability across the continent. And the second map is showing that actually African countries, they have the capacity to produce data. So the gap between the two maps shows that there are barriers to overcome. Um, but uh, traditional or conventional capabilities cannot help us or, or are unlikely to solve the data issue. Um, if it was the case, we've been done with the issue of data since a long time. Uh, so there is a need to innovate. And uh, we believe that emerging technologies can seriously help us to reduce that gap. Um, and a way of doing it is to use remote sensing. Um, what we um, mean by remote sensing is the capacity to sense data from distance using satellite images on what is going on on the ground. Um, several advantages are attached to remote sensing, and the first of them is uh, the ability to cover a large area uh, on the ground. The image you see on your left is a 150 kilometers square. Um, if we want to do the conventional way to send people on the ground and collect the same type and amount of data, it would take years, and still the accuracy that we would have for remote sensing won't be rich with conventional techniques. Um, the second um, advantage that we can see with remote sensing data is that each image gives us detailed information on what is going on on the ground. And that is made possible by the fact that satellite images only not take images on the visible lights that us as human can see, but they can also uh, gather information on other spectral bands, which are uh, the wavelengths on the electromagnetic spectrum. Basically, each object on Earth reflects lights coming from the sun uh, in different ways. So if we know the manners in which they are reflecting the data, we'll be able to identify them and to track their trend, their changes. Um, and uh, the, the last advantage of remote <laughs> sensing is that um, satellite images do not only um, um, collect data once in a year, they can revisit the same area uh, several times a year, which is allowing us to monitor that change. If you look at the map, the, uh, the figure number four, this is the red, green, and blue. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an image, um, but uh, the one layer, which is the near infrared, is the sub-image in black and white or level of grays. That is not visible by a human eye. So this is where remote sensing through satellite images can help us to have more information on the ground. And if you combine them, 
the figure number five showing us the vegetation index, which is the well-known normalized difference vegetation index that can inform us about um, uh, vegetation health on the ground. So we've been talking about object on earth. So let's uh, go a little bit more in detail about what we mean by object. Um, we mean object uh, specific parameters that are related or relevant in the agricultural sector. If you look at figure number six, the X axis is the electromagnetic spectrum, let's put it that way, the wavelength. And the Y axis is the reflectance, which is the amount of light that is reflected by the object on Earth. So here, you, we can see that for water, soil, and green vegetation, they have specific signatures that can allow us to identify them. Let's look at, for example, green vegetation. We see that in the near infrared, vegetation reflects a lot of light. What that means is if we have a spectral layer that can inform us on that reflectance, we'll be able to identify vegetation. So for our purpose uh, on Agua, we processed also information that are um, from raw information to parameters that are relevant in the agricultural sector. For example, figure number seven, the first one is the NDVI at the African, um, at, the, uh, at the continental scale. And the second one is the land surface temperature. And the last one is the um, rainfall. So we do also collect the evapotranspiration. So every parameter that can be sensed from remote sensing by geophysical parameters, we collect them and we try to use it to, to uh, make predictions. Um, now we discuss quickly about how remote sensing can help us to gather massive information and specific and detailed data on the ground. Um, we need to extract them and build up uh, on top of it. And that amount of information is uh, very hard to process for a human being. And this is where we need to get uh, to uh, innovative techniques, emerging technologies such as machine learning. So this is where machine learning comes in to um, uh, first um, uh, disentangle the um, complexity of the data learn the patterns and uh, try to identify the relationship among parameters and how they evolve. Now, let me walk you through about um, the machine learning uh, skeleton. So machine learning basically means how we get the machine to learn hidden patterns that can, might be difficult for human being. Um, for our purpose, we um, building a machine learning for use in predictions means dividing it in two parts. We have the training phase and you have the prediction phase. For a machine to learn the patterns, we have to train them. So let's start with the training phase. Uh, we start with the input X. These are, for example, the um, uh, biogeophysical parameters that we extract from remote sensing. For example, land surface temperature and DVI rainfall evapotranspiration that we feed into the machine. We also provide the corresponding values that we want to predict. For example, here, let's say it's the production quantities that we want. Uh, once fed into the machine, the machine makes a first prediction. It's a first guess. And that guess is compared with the actual value that we fed into the machine at the beginning, the labels Y. And this is where we have the residuals. The goal is to reduce the gap between the predictions and the real value, the labels through an iterative process. Once we um, make the machine reduce that uh, residual at a very low level, depending on the criteria, we have a trained machine. That means the machine now knows what are the relationships between our inputs, again, our remote sensing data and the corresponding outputs. In this case, uh, for, uh, for example, it can be production quantities. We have the hidden uh, patterns learned through uh, by the machine. Now the predictions are the real world. This is where we use the machine, the trained machine, and we uh, fed the machine with the, we feed the machine with new inputs data. For example, let's say this is the beginning of the growing season in your area. We go to the satellite. We collect uh, all the uh, parameters that we need, for example, the temperature, the rainfall, the vegetation index, the evapotranspiration, and other uh, relevant data. And then we uh, feed it into the machine. And then the machine, which is the model, will make predictions for us. This is what we call the Africa crop production model into Agua. Um, 
now we have the model. This is what you can expect um, uh, among other outputs when you go to Agua. So again, we use the remote sensing. We use additional relevant data. Those additional data can be, for example, um, uh, um, ur urban areas, protected areas that we feed into the machine. And then the machine give us here on your left, you can see the production quantities between 2020 and 2017 as a ratio for West Africa, North Africa, Central Africa, South Africa, just to say that our region of interest is the entire continent and for several crops. Now we, um, we know uh, that um, remote sensing can help us if used appropriately and if we um, um, access to the data and generate um, the, the information that we might need to close the data gap in the agricultural sector in terms of data and statistics. But still, satellite images requires to know how to access the data, how to process them, how to clean them, and, and even mapping expertise. So there are several field delivery expertise that are required. Uh, for predictions through machine learning, we now uh, talked about how they can help to disentangle the data, learn the patterns, and uh, make predictions to reduce uncertainties. Uh, but still, machine learning also requires a lot of skills. You need to know what, uh, what model to use, the architecture, how uh, we will use the loss function, the optimization, uh, um, fine-tuning the hyperparameters. Those are very technical aspects that need to be uh, dealt with uh, when building a machine learning techniques. So the path from remote sensing and machine learning to decision-making is not straightforward. Uh, this is where Agua comes in. Agua is a platform that will help you actually to um, take benefits of um, the combination of remote sensing and machine learning without getting into the technical aspects. Um, so if we discuss about the three uh, aspects that are taken care of by Agua, you, we uh, work uh, with, with the raw data from satellite images. and But to move from raw data to knowledge, you have several aspects that you need to take care of. For example, cleaning and processing of spectral bands, time series analysis, uh, thematic mapping, computer modeling, machine learning um, for predictions. Uh, now, um, the stakeholders, deciders, planners, decision makers, farmers, they don't need to do all of those aspects because Agua is taking care of, uh, of it for them. Once we reach the knowledge part, if we stop there, uh, actually we generate data. We have a model, but it will stay uh, among a few hands. Um, so um, it might not be interesting uh, if it's just um, uh, between a few hands for the use. Uh, this is why we uh, go all the way to the dissemination part. And between the knowledge and dissemination, there is a need to build a data-centric web application for accessibility, for example, uh, for the interpretability by building a data visualization tool and also the maintenance, which is very important for sustainability. This is also something that uh, you don't need to uh, worry about. Again, Agua is doing it for you. And then we provide that knowledge products, those knowledge projects online accessible to everyone and for free. It's just a matter of creating an account, but we will get to it uh, later. And then the decision-making uh, can be done uh, by the end user. Um, in terms of key products, um, when you get to Agua, you can, will be able to have access to community level crop production and yield forecast. Uh, you will have a mapping tool that can help you to visualize the data that you want to see, but also you'll be able to download the data for further analysis. You can also have access to cropland estimates based on remote sensing computations. You, uh, at a pixel level, you can go and have a map that can tell you well, where are the potential agricultural land on your country. Um, we do not only provide outputs, uh, we also provide the inputs that help us to build the Africa crop production model, AFCP, by providing ready to use vegetation index maps and time series data, and the same way for uh, land surface temperature. There is another product, which is the crop type classification map, uh, which is um, the, the, an ongoing uh, uh, feature that we are working on, that's why it's in gray. And basically it's the capacity to identify crops from remote sensing data. What it means is tomorrow you can provide a, an, a region of interest and then uh, through machine learning and remote sensing, 
we will be able to identify based on uh, crop phenology metrics and also classification techniques to tell you where are the maize or the groundnut or the sorghum or the, uh, or the millet. So this is uh, one of the features that we are currently working on and to upload on Agua. Um, I would like to thank all the team that um, helped uh, us to uh, develop the platform. And uh, please um, uh, create an account on Agua and uh, subscribe to our newsletter to be informed about the latest development, the latest products and data sets uh, for decision making. So I will stop here. Thank you for your attention and now back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Rasin, uh, for uh, your uh, detailed presentation of the tool. Uh, I will now um, go ahead and uh, ask uh, uh, Dr. Jamal Manjuki to take over here for the um, uh, panel discussion with our distinguished guest uh, um, uh, leaders of the science and technology uh, uh, battle uh, across the continent. Dr. Njoki, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Osman. Um, uh, we and I, I think I want to start with thanking Racine for that really very clear presentation, but also for talking through the whole process of inputting data to how data is then used for decision making. Because if we don't go through that whole loop, we will have data that's not helping us in terms of making the right investments in the in the continent. But also to appreciate what Dr. Bahigwa said in terms of these are some of the solutions that we know are going to help the continent and really that we need to be thinking about putting forward as, uh, as uh, part of the game changers for the UN Food Systems uh, Summit that are homegrown, that, are, um, that work for the continent. Uh, so thank you so much for that. Um, now we are going into a panel discussion. And uh, in the panel, as uh, Usman mentioned, we have some of our science, technology, and innovation leaders in the continent who are overseeing work on how research can actually, research and innovation can support Africa's development. Um, we have with us Dr. Abdu Tekwano, who's the executive director for the Western Central Africa Council for Ag Research and Development, CORAF. We have Dr. Cliff Sibusiso Dlamini, who's the executive director and head of mission at CADESA. We have Dr. Enoch Warida, the interim executive director of ASAREKA and Dr. Suleiman Wedrago, the General Director, Agrimet Regional Center. Um, welcome, uh, gentlemen. I would have loved to see uh, more ladies in there, but I guess it's, you are who we have, right? So I'm going to start with you, Dr. Uh, Tenquano. Um, we know this is not the first time these technologies are being used in the in the continent. We have some experience of using technologies like remote uh, remote sensing. And uh, I have two questions for you, and I'll start with one and give you three minutes to respond, and then I'll follow up with with a, with a second question. And first, I would like you to talk about how you're using AI and remote sensing and how it's contributing to development of crop technology technologies in West and Central Africa. Over to you, Dr. Tenkwana. Thank you, Jemima. It's a pleasure of meeting you virtually. Um, it has been a long time. Yes, I it has to, been. <laughs> <laughs> I want to express my appreciation to my brother, uh, Osman Badian, for thinking that I have something that could be useful to be heard of. Um, I'm just like uh, Geoffrey, whom I would like to recognize. I'm quite intimidated by the topic. But before I go into answering the question you asked me to answer, I would also like to recognize my uh, big sister, uh, the Honorable Tal, who is uh, online. And uh, with that, uh, I have tried to think of this topic uh, very quickly. Um, as I said, it's quite intimidating. But let me say what is changed that is making this discussion even possible today is the connectivity. 
we now have a large number of people connected by mobile phone. It has been a game changer. Someone even said that there are more people who have access to a mobile phone these days than to a clean toilet. So that's a game changer. And we have many satellites. Uh, I have statistics that indicate that there are about 2,300 of them uh, at any time uh, above us. So a lot of powerful tools here. And when we look at Africa, the mobile phone penetration is the fastest growing in uh, uh, the world. I believe it stands today at around 80% which means that there is virtually no African that soon would be without a mobile phone, whether they are smart or not, but they would have the mobile phone. And uh, very quickly, the mobile phone technology would make all the uh, mobile phones available. They would be uh, smart phones. So that is something that is giving hope that we are able to change the way we collect information. I was distressed when the World Bank uh, funded a large project at CORAF, which when we tried to assess the impact of, we had difficulty getting the information to convince that we had used the resources as had been planned for. And then people knew that things had happened. In fact, the head of the team that was commissioned to do the assessment said something um, that I am not trying to quote literally. He said something like, uh, what is on ground is much, much more than what is transpiring from the reports. What is it that we are not able to get data to describe what is happening when we know that things are happening? So there is something to be done here and it probably relates to what uh, Rasin said about the, uh, the, the, the barriers that need to be overcome and which I would call the disconnects. Um, innovation occurs as a result of us impacting on the lives of people in designing systems that are likely to reach the people who need those uh, information. Look at innovation as a supply chain or network with the hardware, the technologies are part of it, the software, the processes, but connectivity is extremely important. Connectivity is something that I will come back to if you allow me. And what makes connectivity useful, it's in if it is able to convey services very efficiently. And some of the services we are talking about today is management of data, capture and management of data so that we can make the right information. CORAF over the time has found useful two areas of application, particularly. One is in uh, um, addressing yield and quality limiting factors. Another one is in predicting climate patterns and making sure that climate information is available. And an area where we are just starting is how to make sure that there is optimal use of site specific management practices. Um, I could come back to that, but the main thing here is that knowing what the potential yield is and what can prevent that yield to be rich is something that is important if that information is provided in real time. An, an area where that is done is in following disease, for example, and giving advice as to the invasion of pests. The fall army worm is one. If we are able to predict very accurately where it's going to be, how it's going to hit, what is the likely magnitude, that would be a good thing. Climate information, I'm not going to uh, be um, dogmatic about it. I'll just quote the former Prime Minister, uh, Minister of Agriculture of Senegal, my big brother, Pap Sek, who said that climate information must be considered as an agricultural input. This is extremely important. And the best way of doing that is to making sure that it is available in real time, in real uh, uh, terms. 
And finally, the way we use, uh, I would say, um, this digital uh, era is in one of the projects that I would like to mention that is at a regional level on the, a fruit fly control project to have a kind of a regional monitoring system that allows us to decide if the fruit fly is in high frequency, how do we, in, uh, how do we come in to prevent it from uh, being a problem? And as a result of that, we have been able to reduce the number of interception of consignment leaving our region for Europe. This has economic value. So Jemima, very quickly, these are quick example of how we've been able to use uh, the digital um, era in the way we do business. Thank you very much, Dr. Tenkwano. I have one quick follow-up question. And it be, you know, you mentioned the role of climate information as inputs. Um, and we know in this data space, we also have to build strong partnerships, in, including with the private sector, who in very various ways have been ahead of us um, in innovating around, uh, around data. So how can we leverage some of these uh, partnerships and, and networks so that we can drive investments in this area? It would have surprised me if you did not ask such a question. <laughs> Partnerships are at the heart yes. of everything we do, really, Jemima. The, the fact is that there have been a lot of tools developed. Um, and uh, first, most of the tools have been developed by the private sector. We have like a, 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 a tool that is what that we call the marketplace of technologies uh, which we developed under the West Africa Agricultural Productivity Program that allows people to know what is available in one place that can be taken to another place. And CORAPS comes in just to broker uh, the, the relationship, I mean, the transfer process. We also have uh, e-subsidies. Um, the mechanisms have been developed, the platform have been developed by the private sector. We also have, um, what we call e-extension these days, advice being provided. Um, and let me very quickly skip here to say, this is an area where you bring in the element of the youth, the educated youth, they come in, they have knowledge from the university and they are very computer agile. They are not like some of us who are uh, BBCs, which was born before computers. Um, they know everything and they are very uh, keen to supporting uh, the farmers with the relevant information. So my take here is that while innovation in technologies, products and services are essential, insufficient attention has been given to the process of how to engage the poor and how to build business models that are able to satisfy the need of the poor while being financially sustainable. So th that's at the heart of partnership. You can't bring the private sector if it's not profitable. And profit here must have a human face because it has to reach the poor. So you need to make it in such a way that the poor can afford to contribute to purchasing the information. Um, it takes a lot of innovation and I'm just going to give an example uh, of recent CORAF has engaged with Microsoft, Microsoft uh, uh, on a particular grant, uh, which they call the National Geographic Grant Opportunity. And we linked our nurses to that. And as a result, we have two projects that have been developed, one by uh, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research in Ghana, uh, that aims to develop an automated system to identify and prioritize crop wild relatives in order to make sure that the genes that are in the wild are channeled into uh, the material they have today for more resilience, which is a good example. The second project is with the Institute, uh, the Institut Senegalais de Recherche Agricole on uh, smart agriculture and livestock management. How do you bring that uh, uh, information in real time to avert crisis between uh, herders and, and, and the crop producers. 
it's one of the uh, two applications I wanted to mention. And uh, let me stop at that. And perhaps uh, if there is a follow-up question, I can, uh, um, I can go that very quickly. But, but Thank Jemima, you. Jemima, mm -hmm. allow me to just say one thing that has changed in my view. Uh, if that was one thing that I wanted to say, we are moving more and more from the what, what has happened, mm -hmm. which require data, to how did it happen, to understanding that aspect, and more and more what I think the potential of these new tools are in is why did it happen? Mm -hmm. Data are very critical. Analytics that we do of the data are also very critical. I like to say that the statistics that we used to have are not robust enough, but I mm -hmm. believe that even so, we used to say that if you torture the data enough, they would confess. <laughs> Today I see artificial intelligence <laughs> as a good uh, 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 practitioner of torture that can give us good information from the data for good decision making. Uh, 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 making. It will help us to save time, but let us not put everything in rigor or processes. There are some uncertainty of how people behave that we need to be able to factor mm. in. The whole data process is extremely good. Rigor is good, but there is that small human factor that mm. cannot be somehow uh, uh, neglected. And I would urge my friend from Academia 2063 to look at that non-quantifiable aspect of mm. human mm. behavior that makes things change. Well, um, I could be speaking for hours. Let me stop there. Yes. <laughs> Thank, you. Um, Thank you so much, Dr. Tenkwano, for that. And, and for that last comment, you know, the data can tell us a lot, but there's also a lot of actions um, due to human behavior that we do not always get from quantifiable data. So how do we build some of these into our, into our systems? Um, I want to now come to you, Dr. Sibusiso. Um, uh, at, at CADESA to build on some of the ideas that we've been hearing from, uh, from Dr. Tenquano in terms of how you're using some of these technologies and data, and especially in the context of Southern Africa to mitigate and adapt to weather-related crisis in the, in the region. Over to you, Dr. Sibu Siso. Thank you, Che. Can I please request that I don't show my face for some reasons. I'm working from home. No problem at all, Dr. Sibusiso. We, we all understand we are, we are in unprecedented times. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. And I think I would wish to greet all the distinguished delegates in this important meeting. So I think most of the issues are common um, uh, amongst our, our, our sub-region organizations. But for, for, for CADESA in particular, what we understand, which is also relevant to the topic of the day, is that there's still a long way to, uh, before we get to, to normality. Now I'm thinking of the impacts of the COVID pandemic as well, because the digital space now, as much as there's been a lot that is happening, but now we have to accelerate the speed at which we are digitizing the agriculture sector. So in, at CADESA, we, we have a program called the Adaptation to Climate Change in Rural Areas in Southern Africa, ACRA. This program basically, CADESA is putting the farmers at the heart of all our coordination of agriculture research. We also recognize all the other role players in the sector, but farmers are our key stakeholders. So this project was, this program actually is focusing on, on rural areas more particularly. So th through this uh, program, CADESA has been, has been enabled to contribute in increasing the capacities of farmers and agriculture research and extending services in the SADC member states to make them become more resilient to climate shocks, to, 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 to enable them to adopt 
technologies that reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to increase productivity. So our approach is three-pronged when it comes to our climate, our climate smart agriculture or our adaptation to and mitigation to climate change. The first and foremost issue is we had to make sure that we enhance information, communication, and knowledge management. That was the first issue. Then the second one, we reinforced on climate proofing to increase the capacities to make our production systems. Could I please ask everyone who's not muted to please mute if you're not speaking? Thanks. So first, it was it's information, communication, and knowledge management for us, very critical in strengthening Caresa's knowledge brokerage role on climate smart agriculture. We, we have a lot of, we have numerous knowledge uh, uh, management products. And in our case, we normally translate to our three languages, Portuguese, uh, English and the French. So it's available, we have, a, we, have a, we have a portal for that. Then we also have emphasis on climate proofing, uh, make sure, making sure that capacities in the region are increased to make uh, main agricultural production systems more resilient to heat and drought stress. And we, we, we managed to impact the Ministry of Agriculture uh, and the local, uh, at the local level, including in Botswana, Lesotho, Malawi, Mozambique, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. And the way we operate as coordinators in, this, in the agriculture in Southern Africa, when there's anything in Botswana, all the other member states are encouraged to learn and replicate. So it doesn't mean that because some countries are not here, they not, they're not benefiting. Then the other issue for us, which remains very critical is climate finance. Kadesa has made sure that we try to, 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 to increase the capacities of, uh, for financing climate smart agriculture practices in the region, in our agriculture production systems. Then having said that, Kadesa is aware that the that there are some artificial intelligence and big data interventions in the Southern Africa region. But we do not know exactly to what extent and if they benefit the farmers and other role players effective and efficient in the agriculture sector. As a result, Cartesa has commissioned a regional study on, on the digitalization of agriculture, of the agriculture in the agriculture sector. And the objectives of this regional study it will, it's going to entail the assessment of the extent to which national and regional policies and regulatory frameworks of the other countries provide a conducive environment for agriculture digital innovations. We are aware that some of the policies are not yet receptive to digitalization. So we want to assess that and be very clear. And then we can see how we can assist those countries. In, in, in moving towards policy reforms. Then we want to actually provide a tool, either digital or analog, to identify the policy opportunities and gaps that need to be addressed in the SADAC region, if the region is to fully take advantage of digital transformation. This tool should be tailored to help countries to compare and harmonize their policies to allow digital innovation and formation of networking platforms in agriculture systems. Then we'll go on to map the various agriculture digital innovations available in each of the 16 countries. We also map the various agriculture digital players in each of these countries and identify their roles. Then evaluate the extent to which the current agriculture syllabus embrace digital agriculture skills innovation and applications that encourage youth in universities and other training institutions or to become digital entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. The last part one is to, we are trying to identify and propose opportunities for establishing an attractive network platform for the countries. 
Then we are going to launch a digital ARC data platform for the SADAC member countries, which will be in form of a community of practice or tool. That is now, the, the study is ongoing upon the realization that even the African continent is moving towards the digitalization of, uh, for actual, for increasing efficiency as well in the sector. Then before I take a lot of your time, Cadesa is particularly going to be focusing on the revised SADA climate change strategy and action plan. And in that particular strategy, we look at the science, innovation, and technology for climate change mitigation and adaptation in the region, meaning we cover all these uh, 60, our 16 countries. Mm -hmm. Then we have other partnership programs where we work with the other sub-regional organizations and FAR on climate change issues. So that is, that is how we are. I'm Thank sorry you. for taking a lot of your time. No, it, it's been very informative, Dr. Dramini, because you, you, bring up, you bring out a couple of things that I think are really, really critical. One is how we ensure that this data is available and accessible to smallholder farmers and especially women farmers and how they can actually benefit from it so that we are not doing data and evidence for, for ourselves, but that the benefits of, of data and innovation actually reach smallholder farmers. And then the issue of policy, how we actually make sure that our policies are conducive to this digitalization of, uh, of agriculture and policies do not act as, uh, as, as bottlenecks. But I also like this idea of a platform because one of the things that Dr. Badiane said earlier is this lack of interoperability of, of data that we have so much, uh, so many apps, so many innovations around data, but these innovations are not always talking to each other. So how do we bring them together in a platform in a way uh, that is actually meaningful in a way that they are actually additive. So I think that's going to be very, very critical. I want to turn to Dr. Warinda uh, from, from Asareka. So we've heard from Kadesa, we've heard from on, on how data is being used to, to adapt to or to support climate adaptation and linking directly to smallholder farmers. We heard from uh, CORAF on how it's being used to, to even detect um, diseases and, and things like that. But from you, Dr. Warida, how can we use AI and remote sensing now to actually support agriculture policy planning and implementation? How do we move from you know, the, the science of data, the utility of data to smallholder farmers and communities to actually then use this to inform policy and, uh, and, and planning. Over to you, uh, Dr. Warida. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Jemima. I believe that I am audible enough. Yes, um, as has been mentioned by my colleagues, Definitely, we need reliable data which should be available, which should be accessible, which should also be adaptable. But this data, for sure, must also be able to be timely. The frequency of accessibility to that data should be very timely. So now, from the Asareka perspective, over the 27 plus years of our work within the region, we sincerely feel that artificial intelligence and remote sensing can be very, very helpful in supporting the agricultural policy planning and implementation in so many ways. Because of the time, they are just mentioned quite a few where we have tried and seen that there is a proper need of making sure that we have proper information to an enhance policy planning, policy decision-making, as well as implementation. Top on the list, we have known and noted that we need a lot of artificial intelligence as well as remote sensing uh, data 
when we want to come up with the national level land holdings, because we have farmers. Some of these farmlands are owned by men, others are very few are owned by women. But the extent or the number of uh, acreage but owned by each of these different family heads is not very clear. And so we believe that the artificial intelligence as well as the remote sensing can be very helpful in supporting the registration of the national level schemes as well as the land holdings. So this can now be used by the land use planners in making sure that as we come up with uh, new technologies and we are targeting the smallholders, we already know who they are, where they are, and these have been digitized and therefore the interventions can be spot on. Another area where we feel that uh, the AI and remote sensing are very important is in supporting the improvement of the crop productivity. We are aware of the outdatedness of the traditional agricultural know-how due to the climate change. And therefore the policy planners uh, can use the predictive analysis, which through the help of the AI can help the farmers to determine the appropriate crops that they should grow and also on the, depending on the productive terrain and the sowing methodologies and all the agronomic practices. So we believe that AI is very, very fundamental to the smallholders in helping to enhance their cropping, uh, their crop productivity. The other area is on the soil health monitoring. And we believe that the AI over the 27 years of our work and also working with other SROs and FARA is that AI and remote sensing can be a very valuable tool in helping to uh, monitor the soil health and to make sure that even the soil moisture and the nutrient uh, 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 mapping is properly done. Do we have a, an interactive continental soil map with the clear soil nutrient and, uh, and moisture content. These are some of the areas where we feel that the AI is very important. The other bit of it, which we have seen and where there is a gap and which we believe that Agua can help us in is optimizing pest and weed management. And given the susceptibility of the region to the invasive species, like fall armyworm, the maize, leather, necrosis and many other uh, diseases, we believe and we feel that the AI and remote sensing are a valuable tool that can help in predicting the behavior of some of these common uh, diseases and pests. And then these can help the planners in making uh, some of the plants to curb these diseases and these pests. For example, there are some technologies which are now being tested like the sea and the spray technology. These are very, very important where they have been used. They help in reducing the expenditure on webis on, on, on uh, we decide by almost 90%. So we feel that AI and remote sensing will go a very long way in helping in optimizing the pest and disease management. Another major area is on water management where we feel that through our collaboration with the, with the uh, academia, we will be able to use the AI and remote sensing, especially the thermal imaging cameras, which can help in continuously monitoring the crops and therefore getting sufficient amount of water. We are trying in a certain project as a Sareka, where we are using a, a technology supported by the Australian Center for International Agricultural Research, what we call the chameleon. This has been used by some of the farmers to help them know when to irrigate and when not to, based on the changes in the color of this instrument we call the chameleon. So we feel that by working together with the, with the academia, we will be able to support our farmers in detecting and also managing the water management regimes. The other area, uh, Chair, is that AI as well as the remote sensing is very important in supporting the optimization of the minimum selling prices of the produce for the farmers. Because majority of the farmers in Africa hardly get the benefits from their produce, but the use of predictive modeling via the AI can provide adequate and accurate supply and demand information, which can help the farmers in knowing how much 
they are likely to get from their produce, which is very important as an incentive to the farmers. Another area is on managing the inputs and also the output so as to know how much fertilizer do we need to import. Food wastage, we need AI in supporting that. Insurance schemes, we need AI in helping even the farmers know which kind of insurance schemes do they need to venture into. So I may go on and on, but truly over the years that we've worked uh, using data from the countries, AI and remote sensing is coming in very handy at the moment to help us in making the farmers a happy lot at the end of the day, notwithstanding all of these climate induced challenges. So back to you, uh, moderator. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Warida, for that, um, for those excellent examples of how some of these tools and innovations are being used in the Asareka region. And now I'll go very quickly to our last um, to our last panelist, I see we really are running out of uh, of uh, of time. But if you have questions, and I see a lot of you have been putting questions on the on the chat, please continue to to do that, and there'll be a Q and A um, immediately after um, the demonstration. Um, by, by Dr. Lai. Um, I'd like to go to our last uh, speaker, Dr. Suleiman Wedrago. Um, and my question to you, Wedrago, is we've, we've, um, could I ask that you mute if you're not speaking, please? And right now, I think I'm uh, just myself and Wedrago will be speaking in the next couple of minutes and then we'll open to. Uh, Q&A after the demonstration. So what my question to you is how um, AgriMet are using AI and satellite um, and remote sensing data to improve real time monitoring of climate variables and yields and to also deploy these cadre harmonies. Um, you have uh, about five minutes, unfortunately, because we are running out of time, but it will be very great to hear from you how you are using AI and remote sensing uh, data at uh, agreement. Over to you, uh, Dr. Wedrago. Uh, Dr. Wedrago, vous pouvez uh, activer votre micro, s'il vous plaît. Merci, merci. Alors, donc, uh, je me suis pour cela. Je voudrais donc uh, remercier Academia, particulièrement M. Ousmane Badian, pour nous avoir associés à ce lancement. Nous le, suis, nous le sommes vraiment reconnaissants parce que Agrimet a toujours été associé à toutes uh, les manifestation au niveau de l'académie. Alors, pour cette question, permettez-moi de voir la question sous deux angles. D'abord, la question des données. Ensuite, la question de l'intelligence artificielle. Alors, au niveau du centre Agrimet, depuis sa création en 1974, Agrimet a mis en place une salle de télécommunication les données de façon quasi permanente, les données d'observation de la Terre. Quand je parle de données d'observation de la Terre, il s'agit des données satellitaires et des données de la télédétection. Alors, donc, de façon permanente depuis 1974, Agrimet reçoit les données d'observation de la Terre. Des antennes ont été installées pour la réception et différents formats et qui sont stockés sous différents formats, des formats qui sont appropriés. Outre ces données d'observation de la Terre, Agrimet a accès à un accès privilégié auprès d'un certain nombre de plateformes. Il s'agit des plateformes MSTAT, Copernus, TAMSAT, Digital Africa et FuseNet. Enfin, la deuxième source de données au niveau du centre Agrimet. La troisième source de données, ce sont les données que Agrimet collecte régulièrement auprès des pays membres du CIS et de la CDAO. 
Alors, donc, nous avons trois types de données au niveau du centre d'architecture. Alors, s'agissant maintenant de l'utilisation de l'intelligence artificielle, comme vous le savez, c'est une approche qui est nouvelle, assez nouvelle. Nous avons organisé un forum intitulé Big Data and Cloud Computing à Accra en octobre 2019 pour recueillir l'avis et les suggestions des spécialistes des institutions de l'espace civil. Ce forum a été organisé avec l'appui technique et scientifique de la NASA des États-Unis à travers le programme Servir West Afrique, West Afrique dont Agrimet assure la coordination. Alors, donc, présentement, comment Agrimet utilise l'intelligence artificielle nous, nous combinons les trois types de données. Celles issues de l'observation de la Terre, celles issues des stations de mesure et celles que nous collectons dans les pays, ce qui nous permet d'avoir des données très importantes qui ont l'avantage de mieux refléter la situation des pays de l'Afrique de l'Ouest. La question a été posée spécifiquement dans le, pour, le cas, dans, pour le cas du cadre harmonisé. Alors, le déploiement du cadre harmonisé commence avec les prévisions saisonnières. Nous avons deux types de prévisions saisonnières, le PESAS et le PESAC, où la contribution de l'intelligence artificielle permet d'anticiper ce que sera la campagne agricole. Installation, les séquences sèches, le plus pluviométrique et hydrique. L'objectif étant de... L'objectif étant de sensibiliser les utilisateurs potentiels sur la conduite à tenir, notamment sur la physionomie de la campagne. Une fois que nous avons fait ces prévisions, il y a le suivi des cadères pour faire l'actualisation des différentes données, les données météorologiques, les données hydrologiques, les données sur les cultures et les données sur la végétation. C'est à partir de ce suivi que nous faisons l'estimation des rendements les rendements potentiels qui sont attendus dans la région, fournissant ainsi les premières informations au niveau du cadre harmonisé. En ce qui concerne le cadre harmonisé particulièrement, c'est un outil d'analyse qui est assez complexe et le traitement des données est varié et multiforme. Donc, la complexité du processus rend son automatisation assez difficile, mais pas impossible. Actuellement, il y a un travail qui est fait et dans ce travail, nous sommes accompagnés par Africa Risk Capacity et avec l'appui de Data Lab à Paris pour pouvoir digitaliser justement les données du cadre harmonisé. Ce n'est pas encore fait, mais ça est en cours. Voilà ce que je pourrais dire sur comment aujourd'hui les données sont collectées au niveau, au niveau du centre d'Arimet, archivées, traitées et analysées avec justement les données sur l'intelligence artificielle. Je vais m'arrêter là. Thank you so much, Dr. Wedroga. I've been following that on the English channel and especially how you're using this to estimate harvest, to forecast, because I think this is so uh, critical in terms of how we move product from production to actually knowing how much we, we, we harvest and the management of that. So thank you so much to all our panelists. If you have questions, please continue putting them on the, on the chat. But be before the formal Q&A session, I'm going to call back uh, Dr. Racine Lai, who will do a demonstration of Agua um, for, for everyone. And immediately after Dr. Racine Lai does the demonstration, then um, Dr. Usman Badiane will take over to manage the, the Q&A. So for me, in terms of moderating this panel, I say thank you very much to all our panelists for giving us those very practical examples of how they're using AI and remote sensing data, because it also gives us some ideas of what's already happening in the region with these partners and with other organizations, including IFPRI in terms of data and how we need to bring all this 
um, all this together. So Dr. Asinlai, over to you, and then back to Usman Badiane for the Q&A session. Thank you, my sister. While uh, Rasin is getting ready, uh, your time is appreciated. Thank you. We know you have a very busy agenda. So uh, uh, we'll uh, take over from here and uh, wish you a good rest of the week. Uh, and we'll certainly be in contact as we um, uh, try to uh, deepen even further the good partnership we have with the organizations with our mother and father, International <laughs> Football Series at Institute. So you Thank, take you good care, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Badia, for having me. It's All been right. very interesting conversation. Bye-bye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So, I think you get ready. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Usman. And thank you for all, uh, for Mrs. Moderator and all the panelists for the key inputs. So I will ask my colleague, Baba Garcise, uh, to walk uh, through the platform and uh, then when we can go to the Q&A session. Baba Kar, the floor is yours. Right, thank, thank you so much, Rasin. So good, good afternoon and good morning, everyone. So I'm going to uh, do you a demonstration of the Agua platform. So I guess now you can see my screen. Are you? Yes, we are. We do. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. So this is the landing page of Agua. So when you arrive, you will see that we are covering 42 countries and also five crops. You have the button to sign in at the right. So when you click, if you already have an account in Agua, you can go ahead and log in. Otherwise, you can create an account. So creating an account is uh, as simple as uh, creating an email. You just uh, fill this form and you will receive a, an activation link in your email. So once you click that activation link, you can now get back here and you can log in to your, to your account. So let me now log in to the account. Is it is it only me, Babakar? Uh, your your uh, screen is blurry. We cannot see the text. Uh, Rasin, is it only me or is it everyone? If that's everyone, can we do something to improve that? Yes, it's a blurry on my side. Babakar, maybe you should let me bring, uh, share the, my yeah, screen. And please. Yeah, please. Yes, please. Okay. So you can stop your screen, Babakar, and then Rasin can come in. Yes. Can you see it, my screen? Yes, we can. We can see it. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank. Thank you, Rasin. So. Uh, as you can see, uh, once, once you log in in the platform, this is the the homepage of uh, Agua. Do you, do you want to go? Do you want to go back to the landing page? Just start from there, so people see the transition. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Rasin. So now you you have the landing page. You can uh, sign in from the the button at the right, top right, and once you sign in. So you put your credential and once you sign in, you, you have now the home page of Agua. So you have at the top, you have, have uh, the about menu, the methodology and the home menu. So the home menu is what you are currently seeing. So if you go to the about page, you will see a description of, uh, okay, a description of the platform and you know, you will see also the, the team behind the platform. So you also have the methodology section where you can find the, all the methodology related to the Africa crop production model. You will find here the different inputs and you will also find the machine learning uh, model and all those different information about the methodology that we use to build the platform. So let's get back to the to the home to the home. So when you go to home, you have uh, two tabs. The first tab is the Agua features visualization, and at the right, at the left, you can you can select a feature. You have production there, and you have the yield. 
you can choose the year. You have 2020 prediction and 2021 prediction. You can uh, choose the countries. So let's uh, choose a country, Benin, for example, or Togo, or, or yes, just one country. And then you have the different crops. You have cassava, you have maize, you have rice for Benin. So let's choose one. And once you're done, you can visualize. Once you click visualize, you have the production of uh, cassava in Benin, the 2020 prediction. You can go full screen. At the, you can use the full screen to have a better visualization. Yes, at uh, the top right, you can use the layers, the different layers. You can choose, you can select a different background. You can put an overlay an overlay for, for the administrati administrative level. You can go until level two. So this is Benin. So let's go to the to the left. To the to the left, uh, we have the second one to to visualize the yes that one to visualize the tools. You have two tools. You have the filter that allow you to uh, filter the pixel values between the min and the max for this production production. You can also change the color scale. You have different color scale that you can choose. Thank you. And then you have the last last one, which uh, which allow you to to download the data. So for the data, you have the possibility first to download the map. So when you click, you have a, a, a pop up that allow you to first copy the citation and you have the possibility to download the map with the download button. So you can do the same for the GOT format, the second one. Oops, sorry. Okay, you can do the same for the GOT format. You can copy the citation and then the download. Okay, you have also data on potential agricultural land for, for the different countries. You can also do the same and you can download it to have it and use it in your, in your document, in your presentation and so on. So now let's uh, exit the full screen. So if you, uh, okay, at the top, at the bottom right, you can see the legend of the map. At the bottom right, you have the legend of the map. Thank you. Now let's uh, discover the second tab, which is the biogeophysical parameters. So let's uh, choose here a country. Attention. So if you choose, for example, Senegal, you have two maps. You have the normalized difference vegetation index map. So this is the latest data from May 2021. You can hover to see the actual values. And below you have the land surface temperature, the LST map, uh, the latest one of May 2021. So if, we, if you take the, the first one, the NDVI map, you can click in one location. So when you click one location, you can see a graph at your right. So let's go full screen for this graph. So basically the, in this graph, you have four lines. So you have the minimum value, you have the maximum value, you have the mean, mean value, and then you have the actual one. So the maximum, the minimum, and the mean value are data of the last 20 years. And then the orange line is the data for 2021. So as you can see for the orange one, the latest observation was in May. So you can uncheck or you can check the, you know, the line if you want to just visualize some, 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 maybe we can, yeah, this is actually the actual, actual trend. And then you have the mean trend, the mean uh, line. So here you can see that uh, the mean in the last 40 to 20 years, is following the actual the actual value actually I can say is following the trend for the twenty the last twenty years. So 
let's get back to let's get uh, back to okay and then you have uh, at your bottom you have the the slider that you can use if you want to target a specific period of time so just below the the, the lines you can see the numbers one until 23 so uh, okay so yes you can see one until 23 so these are the number of observation so this is NDVI data. We are collecting NDVI every 16 days. So it means that for each year you have 23 observation. And just below the observation, you have the month. So these are the corresponding months for each observation. For example, the observation seven is in April and so on. So I think that takes us uh, at the end of this uh, demonstration. So thank you very much. and. Uh, Looking forward to your question. All right, thank you, Babakar. Uh, I guess uh, just one piece that needs to be added is that, uh, Rasim, can you put up again uh, the um, um, uh, pro uh, projections of uh, crop uh, projections map? So you could uh, extrapolate once you add the um, um, uh, administration layers, uh, these numbers at pixel level. And I think that 10 by 10 kilometers uh, that we um, uh, project what the yields might be. Uh, we also would like to people to know that we actually following the cropping calendar by countries. So if a country hasn't started, for example, you wouldn't find millet or sorghum, for example, here, because they have for 2021, because uh, for West Africa, they haven't yet started sowing millet and sorghum. So as soon as a part of Africa start the cropping season for a specific crop, you zoom in there and within weeks, we run the model to let people know what to expect for the next few months, uh, two, three months down the road, what the production might be and what the um, uh, uh, yields might be. So you can zero in at a large scale level all the way to the region but it can go all the way down to a couple of village or a village in aggregated data. So what you're seeing is pixel level. You can aggregate in whichever way you want. Uh, so it allows you to go from a small uh, a couple of villages all the way to, uh, to the West Africa region. So that's the power of this prediction. And we do this in real time. And as things move, you have seen uh, where we look at the biophysical data uh, between um, um, uh, maximas and minimas and how the rest is going. So in real time, we adjust our models and improve uh, our projections. Uh, it gives us two to three months time to have an idea of where things are going and be prepared. And as more crops are added, the rainy season, the cropping start in more countries will expand uh, into uh, your wheat, your rice, uh, and, and so on and so forth. It's, it's a living uh, platform and it's gonna continue like that. At any given time, people can go back there and see what the cropping season looks like, what the harvest looks like, what the yields looks like two or three months down the road. So let me stop here uh, and we'll open now for discussion and questions. So raise your hand uh, if you would like to ask a question. And uh, Julie, can I ask you to perhaps read the questions uh, in the chat box uh, if they get in there uh, for uh, me and to allow the folks um, uh, to respond to that. So thank you very much and welcome uh, for your questions. Let me go to the list so that I can see you when you raise your hands. Oh, Julie, do you have anything in the, um, uh, in the chat box? Yes, we have several questions in the chat box. Box then and let me go there and, and read them, perhaps. Thank you. Or you go ahead and just read them to us. Please go ahead. Okay. I will. So I'll read the I'll read the last question first, and then I'll go back and collect some of the others. Lua Dare Sewedo Dosu asked, "What kind of satellite imageries do we suggest for agricultural activities, and how can such imageries be validated for evidence-based decision making?" Let me suggest to collect at least three or, or four of them so that Rasin can uh, respond to them at once. Please go ahead. Next one. Um, there's also a question from Claude asking about regarding AI and machine learning. Is there any plan to contain algorithmic biases if these biases should emerge? 
And then two related questions. Could, could you touch on any issues of data ownership and sovereignty and interoperability with existing data systems? And last, what is the projected error margin with the Agua platform, if any? Oh, Usman, you're muted. Couple of questions there, uh, Racine, about interoperability biases and error measures, but also validation of data. So uh, uh, please, can you address this briefly so we can add more questions as we go? Thank you. If you're muted, you might want to open your mic. Am I? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the questions. Thank you, Dr. Osman. In terms of um, satellite um, types, uh, we are using multi-spectral images. Um, uh, Agua is based on MODIS, um, which is multi-spectral. That allows us actually to gather all the information we need on the ground, uh, depending on the wavelength. But um, we are currently working on using Landsat 8, which is at 30 meters uh, special resolution. That means that each pixel corresponds to a square of 900 meters square on the ground. So uh, those are the type of satellite we are using. For example, we are not using radar satellite images here. It's just multispectral optical sensors. Uh, for AI machine learning against biases, it's true that there is a raising concern about the biases that uh, input data sets for training might embed uh, into machine learning algorithms. But here we have the chance that um, our data sets um, are not based on anthropologic aspects, which is like human action. Um, we don't have uh, data related to gender, for example. Those questions might be important, for example, when you start, I think someone um, mentioned it, um, to have land ownership. There we need uh, actually to be careful about how we label our data. But here the labeling uh, is based on um, ground data combined with statistical method. So uh, we don't um, now have a concern about bias in the model, the AFCP, Africa Crop Production Model. Um, for the issue of data ownership, um, on Agua, all the data we are using are um, on, the, on the public space. So you can also have access to that data. Our added value actually is to process them and also to go all the way to the machine learning algorithm and make predictions and making it available uh, to uh, uh, the end users. So the data are free, they are on the public space. Since we put them online, you can download it and use them for your own purposes. In terms of projections error margin, we have a mean root mean square error um, of 0 0.98 of the model. In terms of validation, it will be hard to have data at the same level, at the same pixel level as we predicted. So therefore the validation has been uh, performed by aggregating the data at the regional level and compare it with the database that are publicly available. For example, FAWA database that can help you to compare if we are close enough to uh, what um, we know. So those are uh, quickly the answers that I could uh, provide for those questions. Over Dr. Osman. Thank you very much, Rasin. I see uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Yemi Akimbambejo's hand up. Uh, my brother, the floor is yours. Please go ahead with your question. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, it's not a question, but first I wanted to give my my compliments to Academia 2063, to my dear friend and brother Usman, and the whole team out there. Um, we, I, I personally have followed what we are doing today from when it was a seedling, or when it was just a bud or a flower. And today we have the fruit in our hands. So I'm very, very happy um, because I've seen this in its rudimentary form. I've discussed this, I don't know how many times um, Usman had shared this with me with excitement. And today we have Agua being launched. So I want to say first congratulations to all the team of the hard workers uh, behind the scene and all of that. It's, uh, it's a good, good day. It's a good job that you guys are doing. And um, the whole 
essence of the Agua thinking, I think is a big plus to the African agricultural space. It's a big um, plus in the horizon um, on the continent. And I say this because for many, many years, when you are looking out for information that can be um, homegrown, that is real time um, in, in terms of um, advising policy and decision makers, we didn't have it. But I only also would um, encourage everyone that has a hand in this great job that this should just be the beginning. Um, I see that there are five crops there, but yes, let's, let's perfect these five and then let's see how this can grow and become um, an indispensable tool in decision making on this continent when it comes to really talking about agriculture. Usman made a reference to um, the issue of agricultural trade and the AFCTA. Yes, this kind of information, I mean, we've been talking for, for years about um, ICT in agriculture and modeling in agriculture and all of that. I think what we're doing today is actually outdooring a phenomenal tool. And I just want to add my voice to say congratulations to all of you guys out there. And um, we look forward to, to greater works and um, supporting this great initiative. Thank you very much and I wish you all the best. Thank you very much, uh, Yemi. Uh, and thank you for the encouragement. Uh, in, uh, indeed, uh, we'll be, uh, uh, as I said to you on Friday, we'll be following up uh, with you and our other uh, colleagues around the table here uh, to take this tool to, to the next level. So as most of Africa, especially rain fed Africa starts uh, uh, with uh, those who are going into the, um, uh, the Northern Hemisphere uh, into the rainy season now, uh, as they start, we'll be adding uh, very quickly more crops. So we are dependent on the cropping patterns as they start sowing and the setters start picking up pictures, it's difficult for us to get, but the, the number of crops will be going up uh, quite, quite rapidly and quickly. So uh, I saw Shavi uh, Master, uh, Madam Hadith Al Fal, who uh, also se lever la main. Madam Fal, je vous passe la parole. Merci d'avoir pris le temps de vous joindre à nous. C'est un honneur pour nous de vous avoir aujourd'hui. Merci, Madam. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Bajar. Et je vous remercie très sincèrement pour les efforts de travail que vous ne cessez d'accomplir pour notre continent relativement au sujet de l'informatisation, la digitalisation de notre agriculture. Et évidemment, on n'en attendait pas moins de vous, connaissant votre combat depuis longtemps pour le, le développement agricole du continent. Je voulais féliciter le jeune frère du CORAF, Madame Monsieur Akiano, qui a pris la qui a pris la parole tout à l'heure et qui a évoqué des sujets un peu plus opérationnels. Et il y a Madame, il y a Monsieur qui a prononcé la, la discours d'ouverture de l'atelier, qui a évoqué un sujet extrêmement important, euh, Monsieur Bajan, concernant la position de prise en charge de notre besoin en nourriture du continent au regard des importations qui continuent. Et nous avons eu le choc de la pandémie où euh, nous risquons d'avoir des problèmes pour notre sécurité, pour ne parle pas de souveraineté, mais pour la sécurité alimentaire, si on continue à ne pas aller vers la transformation. Je n'ai pas entendu ça des discours depuis ce matin, la place de la valorisation de notre agriculture par la transformation. Je n'ai pas entendu. Je pas entendu aussi euh, euh, la place de la femme dans la digitalisation, la modernisation que vous venez de lancer, évidemment qui n'est pas tout de suite à notre portée. Et nous avons, moi, par exemple, nous disposons d'un centre de formation de renforcement de capacité des femmes. Mais comment peut-on faire pour vulgariser davantage les avancées extraordinaires que vous venez de mettre sur la place publique mettre à la, à la disposition des agriculteurs d'Afrique. Il serait important que les, les femmes, euh, je ne vais pas m'aventurer pour votre position de chercheur en Afrique, sur les, les statistiques, mais vous savez que les femmes sont très présentes dans la production de l'agriculture. 
dans la transformation, la commercialisation dans toute la chaîne de valeur. Euh, que doit-on attendre d'un tel projet pour que nous, en tant qu'acteurs, comme vous le savez, aussi bien au niveau du pays qu'au niveau de la région, que les femmes puissent se saisir de vos efforts de travail, puissent bénéficier euh, de la modernisation des agricultures, aussi bien du point de vue de la production que de la conservation qui pose d'énormes problèmes. On produit quelque part, ça pourrit sur le soleil. Donc, tout ça, c'est des conseils que nous attendons de vous et que certainement la, la prise, le satellite peut nous permettre d'anticiper et de voir les niveaux de, 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 de terres qui sont, qui sont arabes, mais qui sont, qui sont à la porte des femmes, ce n'est pas toujours évident. Et c'était euh, une petite contribution euh, pour vous féliciter encore et euh, solliciter toujours votre appui et en tout cas vos réflexions et le fait de nous inviter à toutes vos activités. Euh, mon frère, sachez que j'en suis très touché et je voulais féliciter tous les experts de très haut niveau qui ont à intervenir dans cet atelier aujourd'hui. Merci beaucoup, M. Bajan. Merci à toute votre équipe et bon vent à votre projet. Merci, Mme Fall. Euh, je peux vous dire que euh, la pandémie ne nous a euh, pas permis euh, de faire le travail de, euh, 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 de prise de contact euh, que nous aurions voulu faire, euh, mais je vous assure que nous allons œuvrer avec votre organisation sous votre leadership pour euh, bâtir le pont qu'il faut avec les organisations féminines et euh, mieux renforcer les gens. Je pense que si vous euh, allez visiter notre site web, vous seriez heureuse de trouver que Academia, en termes de genre, est une organisation qui, qui vit cette réalité, euh, qui n'en fait pas un slogan. Euh, aussi bien notre leadership euh, que euh, notre staff, Uh, et 50% uh, féminin, 50% masculin. Donc, on pratique uh, uh, ce qu'on qu prône, ce qu'on prêche, mais pour vous dire que nous sommes très sensibles à cette dimension genre et que nous allons travailler avec vous, non seulement pour uh, l'accès à nos, nos, nos différents produits et leur utilisation, mais également ouvrir peut-être de nouveaux de nouveaux axes de travail. Nous avons, par exemple, un chantier actuellement préparation. Vous avez parlé de la transformation. Un programme qui va essayer de voir comment la transformation, les petites unités qui sont à 90% dominées par euh, les femmes, comment nous pourrons mobiliser cette, euh, euh, ce secteur pour contribuer à l'amélioration de, de la nourriture, de la nutrition. Donc, la qualité en termes de micronutriments, en termes de fortification et autres. Euh, je pense que nous viendrons également vers vous pour pouvoir travailler ensemble euh, là-dessus. Donc, merci pour votre intervention. Je vais ouvrir pour euh, les autres questions. Uh, Julie, if you have some uh, in the chat box. Otherwise, uh, please raise your hands uh, if you have a question. Thank you. Thanks, Usman. I know we're close to the end of the time period. There are more questions in the chat than I think we can get to. But why don't I just ask um, a few questions about data? Oh, also there Please. is a hand up from Marcel Kwaski, I think. Okay, Marcel, go ahead. Uh, and then we, uh, once Mas is done, uh, Julie has in about three more questions uh, so that Rassin can address those before we close. Thank you. Okay. Hey, bonsoir. Hey, merci pour l'invitation à, à ce lancement d'une plateforme de digitalisation du secteur agricole. Je remercie mes chers amis avec qui j'ai eu à déjà travailler sur le projet IATLA. Je les remercie pour le travail abattu. Et ma question, j'ai deux questions. La première, euh, c'est des outils qui sont souvent au niveau sous-région. Et puis, l'actualisation des données pose souvent des problèmes. Est-ce que euh, ce n'est pas mieux des fois d'appuyer de, les, les pays à se doter d'un système qui permet à ce que une fois que ces systèmes sont renseignés au niveau pays, que le système qui est au niveau central soit renseigné. 
Parce que euh, l'expérience a montré avec euh, PAO, STAT, ECO, AGRIS et e-agriculture et e-atlas que lorsque c'est des outils, une fois c'est mis en place au niveau régional, une fois que les appuis de ces partenaires régionaux sont terminés, on voit que dans les pays, c'est comme s'il n'y a pas eu du tout de plateforme de digitalisation au niveau des, du, du secteur agricole. Donc, la question que je me pose, ou bien ma doléance, est-ce que l'outil qui est créé là, qu'on est en train de euh, présenter actuellement, est-ce qu'on ne peut pas ramener ça à un haut niveau pays pour que ça puisse devenir l'outil de travail de ces pays et que pas, lorsque le pays renseigne ses données, automatiquement, il puisse avoir de la synchronisation et que une fois que ces systèmes sont contextualisés au niveau des pays, même si au niveau de l'académie, il n'y a plus de moyens pour et, appuyer la collecte des données, pour appuyer et, comment appelle -on, le renforcement des capacités que les pays s'approprient de ces outils-là pour l'utiliser à, à tout moment. Donc, je, 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 je fais cette doléance et je demande à l'Académie, est-ce qu'on ne peut pas aller à ce niveau où, une fois que les systèmes sont créés, qu'on puisse aller les installer au niveau des pays et les contextualiser compte tenu des exigences en matière de numérique dans le secteur agricole de chaque pays pour que ces pays-là puissent l'approprier pour qu'on puisse avoir un système digitalisé au niveau de, de nos pays en matière de promotion agricole. Parce que ça fait, je suis au ministère de l'Agriculture, j'ai déjà touché à quatre plateformes de digitalisation. Je viens de sortir d'une séance de prédip qui veut mettre en place le système régional information sur le pastoralisme, mais c'est des systèmes, une fois que c'est mis en place et que le projet finit, c'est difficile. Bon, je parle du, du Bénin que je connais le mieux. L'appropriation et la contextualisation de ces outils pour que ça puisse devenir des éléments de tous les jours, à utiliser tous les jours, ça pose un problème et les projets finissent avec euh, les plateformes de digitalisation et nos pays restent au niveau où le projet était venu et on ne connaît pas tellement d'évolution. Donc, je, 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 je vous remercie et je demande qu'on puisse avoir la réflexion dans ce sens-là pour que d'ici quelques années, les, le secteur agricole euh, au niveau de la sous-région, chaque pays puisse digitaliser correctement son système et qu'au niveau régional, ça soit eh, agrégé pour qu'on puisse avoir une plateforme régionale. Je vous remercie. Merci, merci Marcel. Je pense que c'est une très bonne intervention. Euh, Peut-être je vais, comme c'est généralisé un peu, je vais euh, y répondre très rapidement. Vous signalez notre intention de travailler étroitement, surtout en Afrique de l'Ouest, avec la CDAO, euh, ce qui concerne les, les plateformes digitales euh, d'information et de suivi euh, pour euh, euh, ces programmes au niveau régional, mais également pour l'appui des pays. Comment elle a voulu le faire avec IATLAS, cette plateforme que nous pensons maintenir pour tous les pays aura une masse de données minimale qui sera couverte par nous. Donc, tout ce qui est à les prévisions de rendement et des récoltes au niveau national et au niveau pixel, on, on les fera, mais il y aura beaucoup d'autres besoins d'informations au niveau pays. Et c'est là où je vous rejoins. Il faudra travailler avec les pays, avec la région pour pouvoir avoir ces outils additionnels pour permettre aux pays et aux experts de faire leur valeur ajoutée et de répondre aux questions spécifiques qu'ils auront. Et nous ferons la suite avec vous, Inch'Allah, pour en arriver à, la, à, ce, à cette situation-là. Mais restez, je vous assure que nous allons faire ce qu'il faut pour pérenniser cet instrument-là et vous permettre d'en tirer profit à, à travers le continent. Merci. Julie, can we have more questions? Do we want to continue with more questions, Usman? I think we have three minutes what, left. What's the time now? It's uh, not, okay, it, we have three minutes we have three left. Minutes left. We, okay, thank you. Uh, we're waiting for Martin Fregene to join us. Uh, let me see if he connected. Um, he just sent me an email. Uh, so I haven't seen him yet. Okay, he got um, 
uh, mixed up in his calendar, he said. So uh, let's take one more question. Uh, and if it doesn't come, uh, we'll, we'll just close uh, uh, the discussion, uh, the, the session by then. So please go ahead and just ask a couple. Sure. So another question from Ambula Mama is, what are the requirements that Academia 2063 uses to prioritize the inclusion of countries' data on the platform? What are the main factors that would slow us um, and constrain us from being able to, to include a country's data? And I can, th uh, there's a related question to that from Duncan Samikwa, which is, do we have up-to-date data for all African countries, for all African countries? There you go. Uh, Sin, please. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so just one clarification from Marcel's question. We are not at a sub-regional level. The data is advertised at a pixel level, which is the community level. So that's the power of using AI also is to disentangle and go deep down uh, to disaggregate the data, not at an administrative level, but at a pixel level. And that is an important aspect of AGWA. Um, for, the, for the first question for the requirements to enlist the countries in AGWA, there is no requirement. Um, all countries, our aim is to cover the entire continent. As you see on 2020, we have the all the entire continent covered with the predictions in terms of production yield, and you can also have access to uh, growing conditions. For the related questions uh, in terms of uh, data availability, no, in 2021, we don't have all the data because we are following the crop calendar. So at the onset of the growing season, we uh, activate the model and we produce the forecast before the harvested period. It won't make any sense, I think, to have the predictions after the harvesting period because by then countries would have the data. The predictions would be helpful before the harvesting period where they can use uh, the data for uh, decision making. So it, uh, some countries and crops are already available on Agua for 2021. That's why I really encourage you to um, um, regist um, register to our newsletters because once a new data set is released, or uh, new features, you will be informed. Um, uh, quickly, if you allow me, I also have a question about AGUA relying on remote sensing data only. Um, AGUA relies on remote sensing data in terms of input, but the production values are a combination of ground data and statistical model. This is how actually we build our model. Um, and in terms of taking socioeconomic data, uh, of course, this is the next step. Uh, we already have some uh, one, one paper published for, I mean, to predict the commodity prices. And this is obviously a next step to enrich the number of features on Agua. So I will stop it here. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rastin. Um, and uh, thank you everybody who's joined us today. Uh, those have left, uh, please uh, sign up and register uh, on the, the website. Um, this is uh, a new tool, I'm sure, uh, as you would expect, it will not be perfect, but we expect uh, to get your feedback, your guidance, your comments, your questions that allow us to improve uh, this tool. Let me go back uh, and then say thank you to uh, our friends who have joined us here, Dr. Akim Mbajo from FARA, uh, Dr. Tenkuano from CORAF, uh, Dr. Dlamini from Cardesa, Dr. Warinda from Asareka and Dr. Wedrago from Agrimet. We look forward to building a very strong partnership with you uh, around this tool. There's so much more that we can do. And all of you are active here. There's a lot of experience as Agrimet uh, and, and across the continent. So we look forward to working together with you and building a very strong tool for the benefit uh, of the African farmers and everybody in the agriculture systems. Thank you to Dr. Bahigwa for joining us. Uh, and uh, thank you to, again, uh, Dr. Njuki for being uh, uh, accepting to moderate this session. Uh, so we'll be uh, closing here. I don't think Martin Fregene will be able to join us now. We just sent him the link. Uh, um, let me say thank you to everybody who's been here. Please go ahead and register on Agua. Help us improve it and help us get a first-rate uh, tool. And as we expand, there is an ex uh, of application of these new technologies. We look forward to reaching out to all of you and working together. So thank you, last but not least, to Dr. Lee and his team for another excellent uh, product. And thank you to our colleagues of academia, communications team who made this possible. 
our interpreters who worked with us today as well. So thank you to everybody who joined us. And I wish you a very good rest of the week. Godspeed to all of you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.